somewhere between 900 and 1,000. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to put the dates, the radiocarbon dates. We have a couple of the outliers. There's some in the 1100s. I, I got to get a whole series of new dates to weed it out because mm. they, they, they're ranging for, in, for, into the 1100s, some of the dates. Mm. And there's even one early 1200s date, which I don't think is, which I think is too late. Mm -hmm. So it's just an anomaly, I mean a scatter? There's anomalies, yeah. yeah. We have, uh, what do I have, six dates now. Mm -hmm. So we need to get another six. Oh, there's a quarter after I wonder if we should go. Might as well crank it up, huh? Mm -hmm. Might as well Doesn't crank it up. As many as we have. Well, he'll give us the high sign anyway, won't he? Mm -hmm. Andy? He's the house manager. Yeah. But they're not pouring in, so we might as well go on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we're good. <clears throat> um, good evening. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming and uh, remind you to turn off your cell phones. Uh, be aware of where the exits are on the sides and, of course, the way we came in and the restrooms are out in the lobby. Um, this series is organized by a major uh, community university sponsorship coordinated by the Neighbors of Onondaga Nation. It involves 12 uh, university and co several community groups um, and the program has a list of all the sponsors. It began uh, the first uh, episode in the series was on February 8th and will continue through uh, early December of this year. At the first event, the Tadadaho Sit Hill gave the traditional um, Haudenosaunee the words that come before all else. And that's how the Haudenosaunee began all meetings. Um, and the series will close with that address at, at the last one. In order to maximize our time, we're not repeating that at every event. So the, the, the logistics for tonight is you won't have to put up with me very long. I'm just introducing. And then we'll have the presentations um, by Pete and Jack. Uh, there won't be any question and answer tonight. Uh, we've found that uh, uh, after a short reception in the uh, lobby, there'll be facilitated uh, discussion groups that have proved very effective over the last few events. Uh, we want you to Remember to check out the noon uh, literature table in the lobby if you haven't done so already with the information, the bumper stickers, um, a lot of valuable material out there. And I also need to remind you that the next event in this series will be J July 12th, again a Monday night here at Syracuse Stage, entitled The Two Roll Wampum and the Covenant Chain of Treaties. Um, the speakers that evening will be uh, Chief Irving Paulus, Jr and Professor Robert Venables uh, retired from Cornell, two of my uh, mentors and teachers, and uh, just I think that will be an invaluable evening. I think we, you will all enjoy it. I want to express the nation's appreciation for uh, all of the organizations and individuals who have made this uh, massive undertaking successful. Um, please see the program. And um, now let's turn our attention to tonight's topic. It's a very, um, which is uh, repatriation and the protection of cultural resources. <clears throat> it's one of the most emotional areas of the nation's work and uh, in the work of our office, and I'm honored to introduce our two speakers tonight. Um, I just shared a stage with Pete on this event a little while ago. Um, I try not to refer to people as old friends, but we have worked together a lot of years, uh, both Pete and Jack and, and myself. They, they have uh, put in some invaluable years of work in this critical area. Pete Jimison is a, a citizen of the Seneca Nation, Heron Clan. He's the former chairperson of the Haudenosaunee Standing Committee on Burial Rules and Regulations, which is a Six Nation Committee dealing with these uh, difficult issues. He's now the manager of the Gananagan Historic Site in Victor, New York, which is a former Seneca village that was destroyed by the French in the 1680s, I think 1684. 87. Pete will correct me on that. The French, when they burned a million bushels of corn there, came to the conclusion that there was probably quite a bit of commerce going on. Um, and that's, uh, if you haven't been to Guignandigan, I would encourage you to, to uh, take some time to go over there. They have a longhouse. Um, it's, it would be worth your time. He's also an accomplished artist, film director, co-editor of a book on the Canandaigua Treaty. 
Uh, as I said, we spoke together recently at SUNY Binghamton, I, and I was reminded of some of the difficult sites that Pete and I have worked on over the years, with others, of course, uh, one being the looting of the Cleese site in Hamburg, where a renowned archaeologist was openly digging up a um, former village and burial site with the state historic marker right there. It was just outrageous. Um, we uh, put an end to that and ran Mr. Gramley out of the state. Um, and shortly after that, we were uh, confronted with the Hampton Corners assault mine, a very tragic problem that uh, the DEC did not listen to Pete's advice on. <clears throat> And Jack Rawson was a founding uh, member of the SHARE group, a citizen's group in support of the Cayuga Nation. He's currently the chair of the anthropology department at Ithaca College. He'll share some of the lessons of the Lovana site. He's assisted the Haudenosaunee repatriation and cultural resource protection work many times. He's also um, a leader in a new vision in archaeology that uh, tries to recognize that indigenous cultures still exist and are very much alive and thriving despite the kind of cultural genocide that um, has gone on, and that they're not just historical. And now I'm going to take a moment to try to set the stage by reading a poem by Suzanne Harjo. Um, it's called In the Garden of the Great Collector. Uh, we heard her uh, read this at a uh, meeting out in Arizona in January, and she then I asked her to send it to me, and she's given me permission to read it tonight. I hope I can do it justice. It's not that long. In the garden of the great collector are wooden stakes among the cactus, single white pickets with blackened letters, Indian or Indian marker, and maybe a year starting with 18 or 19. They were once government issue for soldiers and Indian agents to drive into the ground above shallow graves. <clears throat> graves of women who died in at the forts, who could not fight off the white men or their diseases. Graves of children who died at boarding schools, whose broken bodies finally stopped dreaming of home. Graves of men who fell in the ration line, who fed their hunger with poisoned meat. In the house of the great collector is a large pottery vessel that once held a person who was curled up inside and covered with red and yellow okra for the long journey back to Mother Earth. Then there are the smaller pots where clothes and a doll once rested in ashes. The great collector reaches inside and invites his guests to feel his inky, oily finger. In the city of the great collector are the back alley galleries with lurid salesmen with gold in their eyes. And they call you into the back room to show you spare body parts. And they let you touch a baby cord pouch. They roam the halls of Congress saying, psst, psst, over here. Got any exemptions for scalp lock dolls? They open a leather case. They reach inside a money bag, and then they let you caress a finger bone necklace. In the school of the great collector are the secret societies and the old havens for underground trafficking in dead Indians. They pass out keys to a dungeon. They light a single candle. They take an oath in someone else's blood. They open their meetings with Geronimo's skull. They pledge allegiance to the cult of Indian heads. And they vow to be the great skull and bones leaders. In the garden of the great collector are the curious guests and patrons of the arts, invited for lunch and a dig. They each get a spade and a bucket and then a glass of champagne. They all find shards and beads and bones. They all get Indian markers and they pull up stakes and go home, the great new Indian collectors. And so with that, I'll uh, turn the stage over to Pete Jimison. Thank you. Nalis <laughs> 
I give thanks that each of you are well. In our language, we don't call ourselves Seneca, but we refer to ourselves as Onondawaga. So Onondawaga ni a. I am a person of the people of the Great Hill. I belong to the Heron clan, and my clan has given me the name Ganonzadetdown. It refers to responsibilities I have within our ceremonial way of life. Uh, we are often called in English a faith keeper. Uh, as Joe mentioned, I manage a historic site, uh, actually the site of a 17th century Seneca town, in our language, Gunnondagan. It uh, says a town sits on a hill surrounded by the substance of white, referring to white blossoms that were growing there when our people first settled there perhaps around 1655, and whatever those blossoms were, they turned into something edible. Perhaps they were wild strawberries or June berries. Anyway, the people lived on them when they first moved there. The last thing I said was um, I offer words of thanks today for uh, this beautiful day we've enjoyed and then got was Sunday day this evening as well. Um, I'm going to make some preliminary remarks, and, and they may wind up longer than what I <laughs> came here to say, but I'm going to try to connect together these things. Um, it seems important to give you a background to, to kind of know um, what we have been dealing with, I suppose, uh, those of us who have dealt with the protection of sacred sites and the issues of repatriation. There was a time, oh, gee, when Onondaga was regarded as a place of great danger. An evil man with extraordinary powers was under the influence of the left-handed twin. This cosmological reference involves our creation story and how the world came to be as it is. The forces of good and evil exist at all times, and we are challenged to use a good mind. To get back to the evil one, his name was Taradaho, a man we refer to as the peacemaker, whose name translates two currents flowing together, was given a message to spread here on the southern shore of Lake Ontario, Negaiwio, a good message. His was a message of great peace, Ganukwashat, compassionate love, charity, and justice for the people. He was, he was aided in delivering his message by Hanyawata, Heyawata, excuse me. It translates, he has misplaced something, but he knows where it is. And also by Jekonsase, the mother of nations, a Yegowane, a great woman. They helped to spread the tidings of peace, power, and righteousness. This belt which is referred to as the Heowenta belt, is the, uh, is the belt which depicts this message with the, which the peacemaker delivered, and it depicts the responsibilities of the nations, and it shows in the center, some say a heart, and some say the great white pine, Ozoet Gowa, the great tree of peace. You can see that the nations are connected by this path of peace, the white lines that connect. And in the center, it's the Onondaga Nation that is represented there. We are in the territory of the Onondaga Nation, and theirs is a great responsibility to host the meetings of the Grand Council, to be the heart of this confederacy. And it was their leader that had to be overcome and to be given the responsibility of being, you could say, the chair for the meetings of the Grand Council when they come together for the well-being of the five nations, the five original nations, beginning in the west, the Onondawaka or the Seneca, and then as we travel east to the Cayuga, Onondaga, the Oneida, and the Mohawk territories, these represented in white are the territories of our people, which we are still occupying even until this time. There was a sixth nation that came to join us, and that nation was given an invitation to return to us. And uh, this belt represents that invitation. It is called the, uh, the Tuscarora. 
uh, welcome belt, bringing the Tuscarora Nation uh, back after some period of absence when they lived in North Carolina. They came back here in 1722. They became the Six Nations of the Haudenosaunee. Some people refer to us as the Iroquois, the English, the Five Nations, and when Tuscarora joined us thereafter, the Six Nations. Thirty-eight rows of purple and white wampum. In the center is a heart, also the Tree of Peace, and the nations, as I said, are all connected by this message of peace, power, and righteousness. Sachems, while they are in council, are not to allow jealousy or evil to creep into their thoughts. They are to counsel for the well-being of their people. They are sent as representatives of their people. They are chosen and put up by the women who name them. Our people refer to Anandaga, we the Seneca, as Ganokteoge. The Creator had chosen a virgin to carry the messenger, our peacemaker, who was sent to bring unity among our people, the Onwehonwe. The great peace shall rule and govern the earth. The three who work together, Heowenta, the peacemaker, and Chikonsase, had to devise a plan to overcome the evil Tadadaho. They did succeed, and that great law and the chiefs are still in place here in the Onondaga Territory. Here on the shore of Onondaga Lake, our great peace was completed. This is a sacred area to us. It has been degraded and abused by those who knew little or nothing of its meaning for the Haudenosaunee. The lake is entirely polluted and the shoreline changed dramatically. I have to confess, I have a healthy skepticism for what is called history, the history that we are taught in the educational systems here in the United States. In preparation for tonight, I revisited the writings of two of my very favorite authors, Vine Deloria Sr. and my cousin John Mohawk, a Seneca author, Vine with Lakota. Vine wrote in Red Earth, White Lies about the orthodox, dox, orthodox, orthodox excuse me, doctrines of science and their depictions of native indigenous cultures. Our, our societies, whether from North, Central, or South America, have been viewed by anthropologists as on the whole primitive. When an advanced architecture belied the notion that we were primitive, emphasis has been placed on ritual sacrifice, advanced barbarism. It must be pointed out that the mystery of the incredible art and the mastery of the construction indicate a knowledge of mathematics and architecture that is scarcely understood even today. The enigma of the art from Central America and Mexico leaves us amazed and puzzled still. Vine in another chapter deals with the populating of the Americas and leaves bare the theory which has produced the dogma under which thinking archaeologists still labor. Thus, any suggestion that a, that a site in the New World is older than 12,000 or 50,000 years old is met by determined undermining. The question I pose is wouldn't glacial impact, which was supposed to be one mile deep, hide if not obliterate any pre-existing features with the tons of ice and stones covering both receding and being deposited on an ancient site. Vine, in a pointed observation, concludes that human evolution, at least the evidence for human evolution, may exist more firmly in the minds of academics than, any, than in any location on Earth. In short, a history of humans has been constructed by academics, which requires us to throw out the anomalies and follow a doctrine. When I am asked how long we've been here, meaning the Haudenosaunee. How long have we been on Turtle Island? My response is we've always been here. I, like Vine, believe that if, if they can fix a time when Indians arrived in the Americas, they can state you were only those who arrived earlier, and we had a legitimate Christian and legal right to dispose of you and to occupy your lands. John Mohawk spells out the legal construct beginning with the papal bulls, Inter Sareta, the Vatican Papal Bull of 1493. By this bull, 
and papal authority the Vatican granted to the crown of Castile, say Spain, the whole of the immense territory then discovered or to be discovered between the poles so far as it is and was not then possessed by any Christian prince. Indians were viewed as savages, a race that sunk in the depths of ignorance and heathenism. This, is, this thinking is what accounts for the French, Dutch, and English claims to lands occupied by the Ongwahunwe. We were non-Christians, pagans in their eyes, the term is called by Chief Justice John Marshall the Doctrine of Discovery. In his 1823 decision, this ruling revolved around the idea that Indians only had a title of occupancy. We didn't own the land. Europeans had ultimate dominion. Christian people could discover land and take possession from heathens. My ultimate point in this discussion is we will see in time how this kind of notion and those kinds of rulings will allow the U.S. and New York State and, and ultimately the Ogden Land Company to try and dispossess us of our lands. And to open it to American expansion and development which ultimately re rendered the protection of sacred sites extremely difficult, if not impossible. Federal laws have offered some protection, but without enforcement, there really is no protection. NAGPRA only covers federal lands. The Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act of 1990, it really only applies to federal lands. And interestingly enough, most of the federal lands in the West are managed by the BLM, and they don't enforce. The Bureau of Land Management believes they have no obligation to consult with Native Americans. I served a term on the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. It comes under the White House, and it covers all historic preservation within the territories of the United States and Hawaii. And I was the representative for Native people and Native Hawaiians. And I heard these arguments that were posed by the Bureau of Land Management. And I saw the attempts to enforce laws that are on the books, but that these departments don't feel a real obligation, nor do they have the resources or even the inclination to enforce. The US Constitution is always invoked when it comes to forcing developers who own land to protect or avoid human remains. You cannot take away a landowner's right to use his land as he sees fit. In New York State, we have no law to protect unmarked burials. The State Historic Preservation Office will act as if there is one, but we often face undoing a problem after the fact, after the disturbance. And so this has been really the kind of work that I have been involved with. My good friend Irv Paulus is in the back. And Irv and I made many journeys to Albany at a time period when we really thought we might see the state, the New York State Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation actually implement a law to protect unmarked burial sites. After all, every other class of people has protection of their burial sites. But when you have an unmarked Native American burial site in New York State today, there is no law that actually protects us. There is a law which allows New York State Education Department to dig it up and remove everything from it and form a collection of it, a law that goes back to the early 1900s, but there is no law in the state of New York that offers protection even till this point in time. So getting around these issues and confronting these things, this was what we did. I did it for 20 years. I've been doing it for 20 years. And, uh, you know, we've had some successes and we've had some really, um, I guess you could just say really disturbing things happen along the way when we try to enforce these, uh, you know, the, the idea that everyone, everyone's ancestors, everyone, everyone's human remains deserves the right 
and the dignity of a, of a burial, of a reburial, in the case where a museum is holding those. In some cases, I've been negotiating with museums for 20 years. And only this summer, in one instance, am I going to finally see the return of some of those remains that they've been holding. And they've been able to hold them longer because they've been able to say to us, and that goes back to what I started with, that those remains predate the time period when we arrived, that they're older than we are. We, the Haudenosaunee meaning, or we, the Onondawatga, they are somebody else. They're not us. Well, I'll tell you who they aren't. They aren't the relatives of those museum people. <laughs> they definitely are not. And that's the point that I always make, you know. And for many years, I negotiated with this group of people at this particular museum. And, you know, I did it in a very, uh, genu uh, what I call a genuine way. You know, and also in a good, using a good mind. I've been taught, you know, you got to use a good mind. Even in situations which are very emotionally upsetting, you use a good mind. And we always do attempt to do that. And then sometimes I find that the reality is that they were hoping against hope that they would never have to obey the law, that they were using the best legal minds of their city to figure out how they could avoid the responsibility of the federal law. And they had been dragging their feet all these years thinking they were eventually going to come up with a way or that the law would be gutted by some new administration that might come in. But we held out. We never stopped. And when I found that out, you know, that they were really, they were disingenuous the whole time that we had been negotiating, I really had to confront them with that. Boy, they hate to be told that I know how they think, that I know they haven't been honest with us. And then they make up a lot of excuses and they point their fingers, it was his fault, it was my fault, it was that person's fault, but it was never the fault of the board of directors. I don't care whose fault it was. It really is immaterial to me. Just don't waste my time, don't waste the time of my elders and all of us who have gathered there for the purpose of doing good work and for doing what is right, which is putting our ancestors back in the ground and putting them back on their journey so that they can go home. And that's what we really have to do. That's why we do this work. And I thank you for your attention. Don Ejo. Does that sound? Can you hear me okay up there? Okay, great. Well, I, I first want to say I'm very uh, honored and humbled and, uh, and a little scared to share a stage with, with Peter and to have an introduction from one of my heroes, Joe Heath, and the incredible work he has done. The land is sacred. Uh, my training as an archaeologist, including 10 years in graduate school, never mentioned this idea. We were taught that science trumps sacredness. And there is, a, there is still a systematic depersonalization of the land and the people and objects contained within that land that is taught to archaeologists that we have to overcome and those of us who've tried to overcome it by starting a new movement in archaeology, it's called indigenous archaeology, have been subject to a lot of critiques about this. We have lost our scientific objectivity. We cannot do proper archaeology. I had to learn, <laughs> I had to learn from, uh, from the clan mothers who visited sites, who taught me about the power of sites, the confluence of energy there, who decided when 
stories should be told or when they shouldn't be told. There, uh, there, are, there are two forms of site protection. There is the Section 106 site protection, which is based on the scientific, exclusively on the scientific value of sites, not on sacred value. And there's NAGPRA that, that Pete has been talking about, and Pete is absolutely right. There has been systematic resistance by New York State, probably more strongly than any other state in the country. One thing of one part of NAGPRA that Pete didn't mention is affiliation, that their law requires affiliation to be established. So Onondagas can only claim human remains when they can prove it's Onondaga, Seneca is when it is Seneca, etc. And NAGPRA gave a lot of leeway to the states to understand affiliation. And New York State has long decided that nothing earlier than 1600 or the approximate time of European contact can be used for uh, affiliation. And that's what we've been fighting. And, and Joe could tell you a lot more about cases like the Engelbert site, which was one, because we can, we can testify and prove that affiliation going back earlier. The, uh, I've often used analogies of surgery on the ground uh, for archaeology, and, and archaeology is a powerful tool. It's a, and it's way too often been used to hurt native people and to excavate cemeteries, but a growing group of people, including a lot of Native Americans who are now joining archaeology in droves, are trying to show that archaeology can be a positive force for Native people, too. It doesn't have to be a negative force. And one of the most powerful forces it can be is in helping NAGPRA move forward, pushing repatriation back by showing affiliation earlier and, and, and changing these things that Peter was talking about, about how people are denying that earlier people could be directly affiliated with the living people here. Archaeologists can do that. And by only doing the archaeology that is permitted, that is, that is allowed for them to do by the clan mothers, the chiefs, the leaders, the councils, and by, uh, and by looking at issues that, that interest Native people. I, I work in Cayuga territory, and the Cayugas, having been displaced, don't know what, where, where a lot of their early villages were. And they are interested in an archaeology that's done in a particular way. And of course, that can be a very complex and difficult tightrope walk to, to make. But it requires understanding the sacredness of the land. And incorporating that, in my opinion, has always been that rather than uh, hurting archaeology, an understanding of the sacredness of the land enriches the archaeology and, and brings it to a level that it can't have without that understanding. If, I, if we go across the landscape today, we, we see only little windows of that sacred landscape are left. The Cayuga burial mound is there. The share farm that, that Joe was talking about is there. And sites like Lavanna and, of course, Ganondagan, these patches of what was a beautiful sacred landscape amidst areas that are being despoiled. We can, uh, we can start some of, my, some of my pictures. I brought pictures for you tonight. It, it won't just let you go down by the, with the arrow key. And of course, this is what happens if you don't recognize the land as being sacred. And, uh, and this is why this is so important. Of course, the oil spill. Go ahead. And hydro frack we had a session on hydrofracking. I think we need to draw a line and just fight this right to the wall. And I just want to show you some of these windows. This is the herb garden at the Shear Farm, the Turtle Herb Garden. And there was a, a Cayuga picnic this weekend that these pictures were taken at, so you have fresh pictures. And planting trees 
the 1,500 peach trees that came down in the Sullivan campaign, we're putting them back up slowly, one, two, three at a time. But there, there are some of the, there's Bertie Hill, the Heron, the, uh, the clan mother of the Heron clan, and some of the other <laughs> Cayugas planting a peach tree this weekend in an act of, one of the great acts of reconciliation that I can think of. And also this weekend, the first lacrosse game played in the heartland of the Cayuga territory in over 200 years was played. And, uh, and they, I, if you're watching this, no one needs to tell you or teach you how sacred the land is. When you see something like that, people were standing around, including myself, crying, watching this, uh, this take place. And then the Levana site, which was preserved because an 86, now 86-year-old gentleman, Homer St. Clair, thought that this site should be preserved and refused to plow it for over 50 years and thought of it, didn't know exactly why, but thought of it as a sacred piece of land and took good care of it. And the chiefs and clan mothers agreed to have some very slowly done, careful research done there. And I want to share the story of the Levana site with you because it tells you about what is contained in the land, the stories that are in the land as well, whether or not you agree with the practice of archaeology, how it can be done, but the stories and the benefits that, that can be done if archaeology is done carefully and in a correct way. And of course, I show you an air photo of the Finger Lakes, the Levana sites on the eastern shore, it was, it was found by Arthur C. Parker. And Arthur C. Parker, Seneca gentleman, also the first president of the Society of American Archaeology, who dealt with these kinds of contradictions and conflicts in his own life between being a scientist and being a very important person in the Seneca community and a leader and trying to deal with that. And these are the same contradictions that that scientists and everybody, I think, is trying to deal with today. The, uh, and Harrison Follett, who was the main archaeologist of that, of the 1930s, when the Levana site was excavated. So the Levana site represents how archaeology was done in the 1930s in New York, as well as how could we do it today. And it represents a lot of these issues that Peter brought up as well. The newspaper archives from that time call it an Algonquin site. And here's one of the issues. This site is not a Cayuga site. It is not a Haudenosaunee. It is Algonquin, a different language group with the idea that the Haudenosaunee came in and pushed out this earlier group. It was an interesting mechanism of separating the Haudenosaunee from their land by the scientists by saying, look, even the earlier native people are not you. A museum was there in the 1930s up until 1940, including uh, Hollywood actors and actresses were sent there to learn how to be Indians so they could be in the Western movies properly. There's your culture building. And native people dancing, the Onondagas and Cayugas dancing there on weekends. Go ahead. I show this picture because we're, we're identifying native people in there, and that's uh, on the left is Orrin Lyon Sr. And that's Nick Thomas in the middle and Percy Smoke, three Onondaga gentlemen who are, uh, who are so, and, uh, and I'll never forget when I showed this picture to Orrin, and, he, and he was, his mouth was hanging open and his friends at the table were saying, what, what is that? He goes, that's my old man. I've never seen that photo. Go ahead. And some of the some of the things the site was famous for. Go ahead, keep going. Stockades, a stockade. Think of a, of a wartime site, but but when we look at where the stockade was supposed to have been, the stockade runs right through the middle of the site. It makes no end in circles. It made no sense at all as a stockade. We went back from 2007 to 2009 and re-excavated the Levana site. And what you're looking at took six weeks to excavate. So to tell you, tell you how slowly and carefully this work is done. 
also with, our, uh, with the uh, collaboration of our native friends like uh, Donna Silversmith and Corrine Hill from Six Nations in, uh, in Ontario. And these, these things like fire hearts. And what you're looking up at on the top left are hearts, rows of hearts. In other words, a longhouse. Here's another shot of this. A row, that black stain cutting across is a row of fire hearths coming down the middle of what was a longhouse now. Now, when you have a longhouse, you do not have an Algonquin site. You have Haudenosaunee. Go ahead. Our radiocarbon dates, which we're going to get more of, cluster in the 900s and the, ten, and the thousands. So we're talking about the 10th and 11th centuries for this site. Quick view of some artifacts. Fishnet sinkers. Projectile points. That, in fact, those points on the left are called Lavanna points. They were named in the 1930s. And pottery. And I want you to take a good look at this pottery because it is so beautiful and artistic that uh, we're looking at pots that, made m that took many, many hours of decoration. And when we start seeing this kind of effort and energy put into artistic work at a site, we start to think about not a wartime site at all, but a peacetime site. And you may know where I'm going with this. A little bit more of that. And something that took, uh, I, I have permission to show these. Uh, this is a series of smoking pipes with faces on them. The, one of the questions I presented when I showed these pipes to the chiefs, both here and at the Six Nations Reserve in Canada, was what does it mean when faces come out of the ground after a thousand years? And one of the interpretations that people tell me is this means it's time for the ancestors to come home. They're showing us themselves. They're revealing themselves. And there may be something to this because these are clearly Haudenosaunee images. And what I'm being told by the clan mothers and chiefs is that these, have, these pipes have something to do with the medicine societies. And that's significant because the medicine societies were one mechanism from the great peace. When the great peace happened, you have these nations that have been warring with each other for hundreds of years. There have to be social mechanisms to integrate these people together so they can have a functioning peace. Some of the clan mothers tell me that the clan system itself is an example of this. Some of the other folks say that the, me that the medicine societies are another mechanism of this. We start to have evidence of these things. We start to have evidence of confederacy materials in this site. Go ahead. This one, I, don't, I can't see the photos too well. I don't know if you can see this or not. But this is a, a pipe stem with the, uh, with the celestial tree on it. And, uh, um, and uh, Irv Pallas himself saw this right when it, he was at, happened to be at the site when this came out of the ground and saw this and, uh, and told us right away that this was a, a confederacy symbol. I just want to go over some of these th issues quickly. What, it, what is to, uh, to look at a site like this? It is changing the identity of the site from being called Algonquin to being called Owasco. Owasco is a term given by archaeologists to the site. And archaeologists have had a history of making up archaeological terms that separate archaeological cultures from the living people they are actually connected to. And so now we're calling this early Cayuga. We're changing this site clearly from a wartime site to a peacetime site. We looked for those palisades and trenched for them all around the edge of the site. There were no palisades on this site at all. And the massive amount of artistic work being done there, this is telling me this is a peacetime site. From an, a museum of effigies to a place of research, a collaborative and cooperative effort with Native people to understand the site. And 
from looking at small round houses to understanding that this site has longhouse architecture on it. It's truly a Haudenosaunee site. And, uh, and the last question is something that archaeologists have never been able to do until this new movement came in, or they haven't wanted to do it maybe, and that is to coordinate archaeology with oral history and understand that connection between the two. Go ahead. I'm going to follow this out. How old is the Haudenosaunee Confederacy? <coughs> you have lots of, uh, uh, Bob Kuhn writes about it forming in the 1600s as a response to European contact. Other folks placed in the 1400s, Mann and Fields, Barbara Mann and Jerry Fields, talk about 1142, we'll talk about that date. The Haudenosaunee themselves, many of them in this room, will tell you that their confederacy is over a thousand years old. Just a quick look at why this site may date the, may be able to confirm an early date for the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And remember that, that implication for repatriation. If we have a functioning Haudenosaunee Confederacy provable by archaeological data, in the 900s or the thousands, we can talk about the uh, repatriation, opening up not just the Levanta site, but an entire class of archaeological sites, including hundreds of human remains being held in places like Albany and Rochester. And we are, we are ready. I'm ready to make this definitive statement. Uh, this, this analysis is ongoing. I've got probably another year to two years, because when you do something this dramatic, you have to dot every I and you have to cross every T in the report in order to do this. But this is where it's going. I haven't seen one piece of evidence to refute this idea right now. Go ahead. Oh, t turn it back at one for a second. Um, if we're, here's the, here's maybe the, the bottom line and, uh, and that is if we're going to connect Haudenosaunee archaeology and oral history together to understand the origin of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, we've got to look back at the oral stories. And uh, I actually had emailed Peter about this because, because the story I want to talk about is about the Senecas. You've, uh, Peter talked about the Onondagas joining the Confederacy and, and the Tarudaho story. And the story I want to tell is about the Senecas. And it's a, it's a very dramatic story, and, and maybe Peter will correct my details a little bit later on. But uh, the story, as, as written by Mann Fields and, and several other authors, is that the Senecas are in council midday. The corn is high, so that must be mid to late August. And they're trying to decide whether or not to join the Confederacy being being urged by the peacemaker and Jagansa say and Haiwenta. And the most powerful sky sign occurs at that moment, the black sun, and day turns into night. And of course, most people believe that was a, solar, a full solar eclipse. So we went back to the NASA eclipse tables. Uh-oh, that's that scientist part of me again coming out. NASA eclipse tables. And I went to the astronomy department, the astronomers at Ithaca College. I said, I'm looking for an eclipse. And they said, well, what do you want? There's one solar eclipse on the globe every two years. And I said, well, I want one that, I want one in the early 900s, maybe about 910 A.D. And I, I and it has to be mid to late August, and, and, and it was seen in Ganondagan, and it was also seen in Onondaga, um, on it, uh, see, and, and it also has to be about 12 or 1 o'clock in the afternoon because that's when the Senecas were in council at that moment. And they told me, well, the statistical chances of that are about minus zero. So now you can show them. And amazingly enough, we did come up with one. And you, uh, you can't see that date. There it is. You can see the path. And there it is. we have August 18th, 909. But look at the military time on that, 1748. So I saw this time, and I said, oh, man, that's, uh, the date's perfect. And the 
and the path is perfect, but that time of day is all wrong. That's 5.48 in the afternoon. The astronomer looked at me and said, that's Greenwich Mean Time. You have to take five hours off of that. That's 12.48 in the afternoon. <laughs> um, have we proven anything yet? No. But I think we're on our way to a very strong suggestion of a confederacy over a thousand years ago. Of course, my native friends all tell me we knew this already. Okay. I, and, but the implications for repatriation are pretty strong. And to, there's also something attractive about showing an entire generation of archaeologists that they should have been listening to native people a little bit more. And, uh, and paying attention to oral histories a little bit more for their, for their facts and their information as well. I, I never could have done this work without believing that the land is sacred and without the teachings that the clan mothers like, like Bertie Hill and Frida Jocks, who's here tonight, have the things they've taught me over the years about understanding the land and trying to understand when stories should be told and which stories should be told and which stories should not be told. And working to try to make archaeology a positive force for Native people. And whether I've succeeded or not, I'm not sure. I still, we still are excavating things and bringing things up on the ground. We still have unanswered questions about artifact collections and whether, whether what we do with them and should they be reburied or should the Haudenosaunee have their own uh, curation facility, for example? So the questions are not answered. Archaeology will not go from evil to good overnight. But we're on our way, and it's all based on our understanding of sacred land. Thank you. Well, thank you again. Um, we're going to move out to the lobby and have some refreshments, and then please stay for the discussion groups that will follow that. And uh, I really want to thank both Pete and Jack, and let's uh, show them our appreciation one more. Thank you. Well done. Shuts off. Do you know how this shuts off? I, I, I have no idea how this shuts off. You got me. There's usually a little switch on the side. <laughs> you got to push that down. Oh. Up. Okay. Hey, Luther. How are you? Hello. How was our? How was the timing? Maybe out there we can do it. I'll bring them out there. How's our timing, Pete? I think was it that? Out? Was our timing okay? I have no idea. I don't. How's our timing? Is our timing okay? It's good to me. <laughs> I'm not a good critic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. What a pleasure. What a pleasure <laughs> to, to, to speak with you. That was good. Because yeah. Yeah, actually I was. Um, let me get up here and catch uh, up with you. Okay. Hey guys, I'm on a show. Testing, one, two, testing.